Well, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity of coming and sharing with you this morning. And I look at uh, the number on my presentation here, which says presentation number 10, which gives me some idea of how often we've been coming here over the years and, and sharing with you. And uh, I do appreciate the time. You know, I used to often say to young people, if you don't know where you're coming from, you won't know why you're here, and you won't know where you're going. And so it's important to know our history and to understand a little bit of the background. I first started a lot of these presentations for unchurched people, people who love history but don't realise as they study it they're learning belief. And uh, we had a wonderful time at Cheltenham in the home of one of my um, folk from Thornley Church and they invited people from all over the different walks of life, ex-politicians and atheists, uh, Catholic backgrounds, a whole variety of them who loved history. And as we went through a lot of these presentations, they began to realise that there were certain things that happened in that first 100 years that they'd never heard about before. And baptism by immersion is one of them. Because so many of the churches do baptism by sprinkling. And so when you go back to that first 100 years and you look there, the facts of history are all there. And it's wonderful to be able to go through it. But this morning... <coughs> I thought overlapping the years of Martin Luther, we have one of the most widely followed Protestant reformers in the history of the church. It's been suggested that his influence on the development of Protestantism has been both deep and diverse, reaching well beyond the many Reformed and Presbyterian bodies that we see today. Now he was involved, along with many other reformers of his time, in returning to the Holy Scriptures long been hidden from the common people. And as a systematic theologian, a biblical scholar, and as a church teacher and a pastoral counsellor, he was to challenge the very foundation of the teachings of the medieval Church of Rome. He was also seen to be a very intricate and complex person. He was a free thinker, not fitting in with the status quo. Today I'd like to share with you the life of this man, a man called John Calvin, who lived from 1509 through to 1564. And in contrast to Martin Luther, Calvin was seen as a quite sensitive man. So if you know anything about Martin Luther, Calvin, in contrast, was a quite sensitive man, but one who had an absolutely immovable will. And it was this iron will that enabled him to systematise the Reformed tradition in Protestantism. He was born the fourth child to Gerard and Jeanne Corvin, just over 500 years ago, at a place called Noyon in northeastern France on the 10th of July, 1509. He was to be called Jean Corvin, but we know him by his anglicised name of John Calvin. And as we'll see later, he was to spend most of his life outside the country of his birth. And while his father Gerard had become a very successful lawyer by profession, his grandparents came from more common stock. They came from a long line of innkeepers, barrel makers and boatmen. His mother, on the other hand, was apparently well known for her beauty and strong commitment to the church. But sadly she was to pass away just after the birth of her fifth child when John was just three years of age. Not much else was really known about her. Gerard married again, adding two more daughters to the family home. And it's interesting that one of those girls eventually came to live with her famous stepbrother later in his life. At the time that Calvin was born, there was already much talk circulating throughout France of a new reformation that was taking place in the church. They were saying that a German by the name of Martin Luther who'd recently received his BA in theology, was now giving lectures on obtaining salvation through a relationship with God. This was unheard of. A relationship with God was not part of the teachings of the medieval church. And this was eventually to make a great impression on young John Calvin as he later became aware of these new beliefs. Now, before we go any further, let me just share you the names and locations of some of the places we'll be uh, referring to today. 
Now, the early part of Calvin's life was to revolve around his birthplace. And we've got here Noyan, just up to the north east, the little town. And we also have the university cities of Paris, Orleans, and Bourges, where he received his education. And then finally, Geneva, where he was to spend most of his working life. Now, because of his father's middle-class connections, he was to be educated privately, being tutored alongside the sons of an aristocratic family. Sometimes girls were able to sneak into those uh, times when the boys were being tutored. Girls were never a part of the education process of those times, but many of those in the aristocratic circles were able to come in and be tutored at that particular point. His father was to plan for him a career in the church, and the path to this end lay through the University of Paris. And it was here that Calvin was to study theology and later law and Greek. Now these fellows, you've got to have a fairly good mind when we're looking at the sorts of areas that they were going to be involved in. At the time he commenced though, he was only 14 years of age. Now 14 years to be moving into higher education is not a bad start for any person. By the mid-1520s he'd completed the arts course under the patronage of one of his father's friends and was seen to be an excellent scholar who was now qualified to take up the more intensive study of theology. And it was at this point that his father then suddenly changed his mind about the boy's future and decided that John should achieve greatness in law rather than following a career in the church. Now you've got to have a different mindset when we talk about law. As a dutiful son, he commenced the study of law at the University of Orleans and then later at the University of Bourges, attaining high distinction in a course for which he had absolutely no love at all. He left six years later in 1529 at the age of 20 with a doctoral degree. Now we need to recognise that John Calvin was no ordinary person. He had an absolutely brilliant mind and he was eager to learn. However, his zeal for learning led him to neglect the need for proper nourishment and adequate sleep, resulting in health issues that would remain with him for the rest of his life. When Calvin first enrolled at the University of Orleans in 1523, it was only three years after Martin Luther had defiantly burned the papal bull threatening his excommunication by the church. And it was during Calvin's time at university that the Reformation had taken a real foothold and was seen to be exploding right throughout the countries of Europe. The church at this time was to be found in a very sad state. Now we're talking here about the medieval church. There was only one church. Immorality was rampant. Theological education was an all-time low. The church authorities were believed to be more concerned about defending their current traditions and doctrines with very little desire to pursue spiritual or scriptural truth. By this time, printing presses were now turning out Greek New Testament scriptures very cheaply. And with this ready access to the press, Calvin now publishes his first book in 1532 at the age of 23. And with the wide dissemination of printed materials now taking place, he was to be strongly influenced by the writings of Martin Luther and the man called Desiderius Erasmus, who was known as one of the greatest of the Christian humanists of that period. Remember, Christian humanists were distinct from secular humanists. Christian humanists went right back to the traditions of the early fathers and so on. So Christian humanists were so-called. They studied the Christian classics, concentrating on the Old and New Testaments, and the writings of the early church fathers, and this was in contrast with the secular humanists who studied and taught the secular classics, such as Cicero and Plato, all the Greek background. As a result of his conversion, that it was after, sorry, it was after reading the New Testament translations published by Luther and Erasmus that Calvin was converted to the evangelical faith about 1533. He is now 24 years of age. His father had died just two years before. And as a result of his conversion, Calvin now believed that God had tamed his mind and made it more teachable. 
Now, I've often said this before, without humility, a person will never learn. You cannot teach an owl, and I've had many of them in my classes over the years, you can't teach somebody who believes they have all the answers. And so without humility, a person can never, ever learn. And, and Calvin now says that God tamed his mind and made it more teachable. He was also able to say that God subdued and brought my heart to docility. He says it was more hardened against such matters than was to be expected in such a young man. And a short time later, he broke with Roman Catholicism. And after persecution broke out against France, against Lutherans, he initially fled to Basel, then to Italy, and then back to Switzerland. Intending only to stay overnight in Geneva, William Guillaume Farrell, a French reformer, persuaded him to stay, and he remained there for the rest of his life. In speaking of that decision, Calvin is reported as saying that God thrust me into the game. God thrust me into the game. In 1536, he published his monumental Institutes of the Christian Religion, or Instruction as it was called in the Christian Faith, and then he published a Confession of Faith in 1537. Now, the Institutes of the Christian Religion was a very brief, but a very, a very clear defence of Reformation beliefs and in this document he says this, and I want you to listen to it. Wherever we find the word of God surely preached and heard and the sacraments of baptism and communion being administered according to the institution of Christ, there, it is not to be doubted, is the church of God. Now let me repeat that. Wherever we find the word of God surely preached and heard, that's what this pulpit's all about here, he says, wherever we find that in the sacraments of baptism and communion being administered according to the institution of Christ, there it is not to be doubted is the church of God. Let's hope that could be said here. It was during an idle moment, during one of his lectures, that John Calvin was caricatured by one of his students. And the image that you're looking at there is the one that's reflected in many books written about him. So remember, this is a caricature. Uh, in terms of what he looked like. Now, it was at this time in 1538, after calling the townspeople together to swear loyalty to their Protestant statement of belief, that both Farrell and Calvin were banished by the government from Geneva. They got a bit too aggressive. Mob violence had broken out against them. As a result of the very strict rules, they attempted to enforce on those who were to continue practising an immoral lifestyle. So this gives you some idea of some of the issues that may take place when you follow down that route. It was during that period of exile that Calvin used his time then to write a commentary on the Book of Romans. How many of you have studied the Book of Romans? You know what a commentary would be like having to do uh, that particular book. During that time, he marries an Anabaptist widow by the name of Idolette Storder de Boer. He had two young children. They were married in August 1540. Now we need to recognise that Anabaptists at that time were a highly persecuted group because of their belief in baptism by immersion. The Baptist Church doesn't like to think of them as their forebears. Uh, but baptism by immersion for the Anabaptists and many were then to be martyred by drowning as a result. Sadly, from this marriage with Idolette, Calvin had no children. It was his five infancy and she had three of them. Many of his critics were to take advantage of these very tragic occasions and suggest it was God's judgment on their lives as a result of hidden sins and disobedience. Quite common to respond in that particular fashion. On Farrell's prompting, Calvin was later to receive a very gracious invitation from the city governors to return to Geneva in 1541. They desperately wanted him back and spared no expense to get him there. He's now 32 years of age. He now attempts to make Geneva a model Protestant city. Some danger signals here. He wanted a visible city of God in Europe, starting with Geneva. And it was at this time that he tried to bring every citizen under the moral discipline of the church. And as you can imagine, this was again to be the cause of many, many disputes. In 1549, eight years after their return to Geneva, Idolette died. 
They had only been married for nine short years. Calvin was now 40 years old and was now left to raise her two children as his own. He never married again, but after bearing his grief and loss, he threw himself completely into his work. Ten years later, he establishes Calvin College, it's as you see it today, becomes a citizen of Geneva in 1559. He died five years later in 1564, and he was only 55 years of age. But at the time of his death, most of France and Scotland and parts of Switzerland and the Netherlands followed his strong beliefs that had an emphasis on a covenant heavy with sanctification. People either loved or hated him. There was no middle ground. The mere mention of his name was to elicit strong reactions and emotions both for and against him. Some of the paintings of that time showed him in a rather unflattering light. His enemies coined the saying by comparing him with his successor that it would be better with Beza, who was his successor, it would be better with Beza in hell than with Calvin in heaven. It's a pretty strong word. Such were some of those feelings fell against him at that time. However, his close friend and successor, Theodore Beza, wrote this. He said, I've been a witness of him for 16 years, and I think I'm fully entitled to say that in this man, that's Calvin, there was exhibited to all an example of the life and death of the Christian, such as it will not be easy to depreciate and it will be difficult to imitate. Calvin was never ordained by either Catholics or Protestants as he felt that his call was from God alone. His pulpit was to be found in St. Peter's Cathedral. However, Lutheranism strongly influenced his doctrine. He believed that all knowledge of God is found where? It's found only in the Word, and as such, he was a careful interpreter of the Bible. He still made mistakes, by the way. He was a careful interpreter of the Bible. He believed that pardon and salvation are possible only through the free working of the grace of God. He originally baptised both children and adults by immersion or sprinkling, but later came to the conviction that baptism by immersion of persons after they reached the age of accountability was the only valid one. So it's interesting that after all of that, he comes back to that point. Sadly, he came to believe in Augustine's view of predestination, and this belief has continued to be the cause of discouragement for many Christians right down through to our present day. Now, this is where God supposedly chooses some for salvation and others for destruction, leaving no room for a choice to be made. Now, you heard what I said this morning, choose you this day whom you will serve. You need to know that. He relied on the civil powers to enforce his religious beliefs. Big mistake. He said the church was supreme and it was this involvement of church and state that was to lead to various forms of persecution. Always remember, when the church joins forces with the state, the only result can be is persecution. And we need to keep that in mind. It was treading on some very dangerous ground and was a belief that was held by many other reformers, by the way, during the 16th century. And this belief brought about the burning at the stake of a man called Michael Servetus, an anti-Trinitarian who was considered a heretic by both Catholic and Protestant forces. And this incident was to become a major blot on the very positive record of Calvin's ministry. Along with many other reformers, he advocated not only the abolition of the mass and clerical celibacy, but also the abolition of the belief in purgatory. He believed teachers in religious schools should be classed with the ministers of the gospel, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. I always remember the little credential I had which called me Mr. Teacher. And that, by the way, solved some problems as far as uh, our wages were concerned when it came to the Independent Teachers Union. We held that little credential. We were minister teachers, and I felt very strongly about that fact. So he believed that. In religious schools, they should be classed along with ministers of the gospel. He believed that the dead know not anything until the resurrection. Now, here's a good one. Uh, Brian Ball wrote a book called Soul Sleep, 
and he traces the belief in the fact that of, of being uh, death being asleep until the Lord comes and he traced it through all the reformers down. You know, Martin Luther believed this, but his parishioners, he felt, weren't ready for it, and so it was never given. But here we have John Calvin saying he believed the dead know not anything until the resurrection. And he encouraged congregational hymn singing. He saw that as a gift from God. Don't you ever underestimate music and the power of music in your church. He did not waste a minute of his time. We could learn something from this. Even on his deathbed, he wouldn't refrain from work. And he's recorded as saying this, What? Would you have the Lord find me idle when he comes? He died as poor as he'd lived, and no other title he had than pastor, which means what? Shepherd. And we should never forget that, by the way, and our pastors should never forget shepherd of the flock. He wanted no Protestant shrine after his death. And according to his instructions, he was to be buried in a common cemetery and the traditional site, not the actual site, the traditional site shows a plain grave with a very small stone with the fading initials JC carved on it. And the number of that grave is 707, so if you're ever over that way and you want to visit, you will find it there, but John Calvin may not be in it. The exact location still remains very much unknown. Calvin worked in Geneva for almost 25 years and he preached five times a week. So if we think we're badly done by, by doing two on Sabbath, five times a week that he was doing. He lectured to classes of theological students, wrote a commentary on almost every book of the Bible and other essays on theological topics. His correspondence alone fills 11 volumes. His influence on the development of Protestantism and the modern church was far-reaching, taking it far beyond the Reformed and Presbyterian bodies to early Baptists and to the Congregationalists. It even reached into the Anglican faith through men such as Spurgeon, Edwards and Whitfield. And we see it in the Puritan movements in England and America and in France where the Calvinists were called Huguenots. And if time gives me, if I come back enough times, I'll give you a full history on the Huguenots. It's a wonderful history and what happened in France and the recognition by France of what took place during those times had only just been recently uh, acknowledged. This latter group, the Huguenots, were heavily persecuted by the medieval church and as such their meetings had to be held in secret away from the centres of population. Uh, we may be able to see here these pulpits uh, were portable. They folded up, they took them up into the valleys so they could preach away from the eyes of those that would do them harm. Calvin's influence on Geneva, that later became known as the City of Calvin, came from his organising, his admonishing and his writing, but mainly from his preaching. And in short, he fulfilled his ministry as a pastor. He preached nearly every day of the week, he, twice on Sundays with sermons that lasted more than an hour. He saw preaching like a visitation from God drawing people to himself. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? He saw preaching like a visitation from God drawing people to himself. And that's why it's important whoever gets behind this desk needs to be able to bring people to that point. Geneva's population doubled in 10 years as Protestant refugees flooded that city from France, from Italy, from England, from Scotland, from Holland and elsewhere. It became a place of refuge. In 1559, he established the University of Geneva. It was mainly designed as a theological seminary and a law school. However, its main focus was on theology and this emphasis continued through to the 17th century. It was only in 1873 it dropped all religious affiliation and became officially secular. Look back in the history of your higher educational institutions in the United States and you'll see that most of them started as theological colleges. Most of them now are completely secular, with theology being part a little department that's found within the institution. This one is now the second largest institution of its type in Switzerland, 
with an enrolment of over 15,000 students. If John Calvin could see the role that Geneva now plays in international and ecclesiastical affairs, I often wonder whether he would be smiling or frowning or just plain perplexed. If you were to visit Geneva today, you would see Calvin depicted on the large Reformation wall, along with such notables as William Farrell, Theodore Beza, who I'm going to be talking about with War Hope next week, and John Knox. And these four great men of the Reformation were all found together in Geneva in 1559. It is an incredible monument. 100 metres long, it was built in the grounds of the University of Geneva, with the first stone being laid in 1909 as part of the 400th anniversary of Calvin's birth. Made of Burgundian quartz and Mount Blanc granite, it also has scenes depicting Oliver Cromwell and Roger Williams from America. Geneva has been often referred to as the Rome of Protestantism and is situated on the western end of Lake Geneva, connecting with the Rhone River. It's got a long history. It goes right back to the Roman Empire, with Julius Caesar passing through the city in 58 BC on his first Gaelic expedition. And there's a plaque on one of Geneva's main buildings to remind us of that event. And many of its streets are named after the reformers like Calvin and Farrell. St Peter's Cathedral is known as the adopted home church of John Calvin, was built between the 12th and the 13th centuries, was rebuilt in the 18th century and has been a Protestant church since 1536. It now belongs to the reformed Protestant church of Geneva. Calvin's pew, his pulpit and chair have all been retained in the cathedral and be seen there if you go there today. Just east of the cathedral is what they call the Auditorium of Calvin and was used for lectures for ministers and ministers in training from 1562. And John Knox, the thundering Scot, preached here while he was staying in Geneva. Also east of the cathedral is Calvin College, founded by Calvin in 1559 and is now the oldest public secondary school in Geneva. You know, while we can't agree with all of Calvin's beliefs, a member of his pastoral team summed up Calvin's ministry by saying this. He says, what labours, what long waking hours, what worries he bore, with what faithfulness and intelligence he took an interest in everyone, with what kindness and good will he receive from those who turn to him, and with what rapidity and openness he answered those who questioned him on the most serious of questions, with what wisdom he received both privately and publicly, the difficulties and problems brought to him, with what gentleness he com comforted the afflicted, raised those who were laid low and discouraged, with what firmness he resisted the enemy, with what zeal he brought low the proud and the stubborn, with what greatness of soul he endured misfortune, with what moderation he behaved in prosperity, and with what skill and enthusiasm finally he acquitted himself of all the duties of a true and faithful servant of God, words of mine could never, ever express. You know, it's been said that Calvin stands as one of the most conspicuous religious leaders of the 16th century, perhaps second only to Martin Luther. Intellectually, he ranked among the best scholars of his period, and his writings stand today as a most worthwhile contribution to the world's religious thought. He was a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. It's a reminder again that God can use anyone regardless of their faults, to further his work. And when we look at Calvin's life and work, let me tell you, we have much to thank him for. Well, God bless you. Hopefully that will give you some idea. 16th century was full of men like John Calvin. God bless you.